Today we start the last section of this course, uh, Chapter 9, Drag and Lift. Drag and lift result from the interaction of fluids and the surface of objects. It's the result of two different forces that act at that interface. The first is shear stress, and this always acts parallel to the surface, and this is basically the fluid rubbing against the object. And then the second force is pressure force, and this always acts perpendicular to the surface object, the surface of the object. And um, it's due to different pressure distributions that develop as the flow travels around the object. When you sum up those forces and combine them, we typically break them up into two components. The component perpendicular to the direction of flow, we call lift, and the force parallel with the direction of flow we call drag. Drag and lift can be described mathematically with these two equations and as you can see they're both functions of two components, a pressure component and a friction component due to the shear stress. And what these equations show is all you need to do is is tally up all of the pressure and all of the friction and integrate it over the surface of the object. The sine and cosine theta is that's to take care of the different directions where theta is the angle between the surface normal vector and the flow direction. So if you did know the complete pressure and shear stress distribution on an object you could perform these integrations and determine the, the total drag and lift. It turns out that this is this is typically not a good way to go about it. We, we really don't use these equations. But it's important to understand from the outset right here that drag and lift are solely a function of these two things and nothing else. Another thing to point out is with lift, uh, shear stress does not play a role. Lift is entirely due to the pressure distribution around the object. Okay, the rest of this presentation is going to be on friction drag and this is a specific case for drag. Um, the general equation for drag and also for lift actually is it's one half times coefficient of drag times the density velocity squared times the area. Um, so the drag is a force and since we have a subscript F there that refers to the drag just due to friction the coefficient of drag, this is a dimensionless number, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time. This is the hardest thing to figure out. You could consider this a fudge factor. This really this takes into account a lot of different things that are hard to quantify. The other things, so density is obvious. It's the density of the fluid. Um, we use u for, visco for velocity rather than v, and that's to designate that we're talking about the fluid velocity relative to the object. So, so we've changed our coordinate system here. We now assume that the object is stationary and the fluid is flowing past it. Okay, so as fluid passes over this flat plate, it forms a boundary layer. And the boundary layer typically looks something like this. At the first portion of the plate, it is a laminar boundary layer. And then as the flow continues across that, that plate, it gets more and more turbulent and eventually forms a turbulent boundary layer. And we can quantify this, this transition between laminar and turbulent conditions using the Reynolds number. But if you'll notice, the Reynolds equation is a little bit different. Before we had diameter of pipe in there, we're not using, that doesn't make any sense in this case, right? So we use x. And that is just the distance along the length of the plate, starting at the front end. So if you think about this, this is quite different than what we're used to. We could talk about the Reynolds number for flow down a pipe. We can't talk about the Reynolds number for flow across a plate. In fact, the Reynolds number varies along the length of the plate. So it's going to be different at the first couple inches of the plate as it is the last couple inches of the plate. So the Reynolds number increases as you move along the length of the plate. That is, the flow gets more and more disorganized as it continues along that surface until eventually it transitions to a turbulent boundary layer. And it continues to get more turbulent after that. 
that transition happens at a Reynolds number of around 5 times 10 to the fifth. So if we're in that front portion of the plate, or if the plate is short enough that it doesn't have a chance to transition to turbulent flow, we have a laminar boundary layer. And everything we've learned about laminar conditions applies here. It's independent of roughness. And we can derive a lot of equations to describe flow conditions in this situation. I'm going to use the prandtl blasius solution, which is just one of a number of solutions that are out there. This is also the solution that is in your FE handbook. So we can calculate the thickness of the boundary layer. We can also calculate the shear stress at any location in the boundary layer. Now notice these two equations are a function of x. So the thickness of the boundary layer changes depending where you are on the plate. As you get further away from that front edge, the boundary layer gets thicker and thicker. The shear stress actually decreases as you get further along on the plate. And then the coefficient of drag itself can be calculated with this equation. Now notice the Reynolds number in here, this is REL, where you use the, the back edge of the plate as your distance. So this coefficient of drag, this is a single number for the whole plate. It doesn't vary along the length of the plate. You, pick, you use the entire length of the plate and calculate the Reynolds number at that back edge and use that to calculate the coefficient of drag for the entire plate. If you have turbulent conditions, we have a more tricky situation, right? Because now we have unpredictable flow behavior. We can't derive any fundamental equations for it. So we're stuck with dimensionless numbers again. We have coefficient of drag as some function of the Reynolds number and the relative roughness. So this is just like Moody, and your textbook has a very Moody-like equation. So we've got type curves of different relative roughness. You read across till you hit a Reynolds number. At that match point, then gives you a um, coefficient of drag. Um, notice the laminar line is on there. You can use that line from this equation, or can, you can use the equation that I just gave you in the previous slide. And notice also there is a line for a smooth plate. Um, in your FE handbook, it has an equation for that line. So you can use that equation as well if you've got a smooth plate, rather than having to go to this figure. Okay, so the basic procedure for calculating friction drag is first to find the Reynolds number for your at the back edge of your plate. If it's still laminar through the entire length of the plate, then you can use your laminar equation for the coefficient of drag. If the back edge of the plate is turbulent, then you can either use that figure that we just looked at with relative roughness, or if it's smooth, you can use the equation for the coefficient of drag. Now keep in mind that when it's turbulent at the back edge of the plate, there's a laminar region in the front port, front portion of the plate, and then it transitions to turbulent, and by the time you get to the end, it's, it's turbulent boundary layer. This coefficient of drag, which you calculate for turbulent conditions, counts for the whole plate. So you don't have to break it up and look at the laminar and, and turbulent portions separately. This coefficient of drag for turbulent flow conditions will give you the drag for the entire plate. And then you just plug into your drag equation. So again, finding the coefficient of drag is the hardest part. Once you've done that, it's obvious what density, velocity, and area are. Okay, let's do a quick example. We have a flat sign that's like on the side of a truck, for example and it's 10 foot by 10 foot. And we have another one that's the same area but is um, proportioned differently. It's 20 by 5 feet. So we have flow across a single side of these signs. Calculate the drag on each sign. We're going to use a velocity of 29.3 feet per second. And then the density and viscosity are typical numbers for air, which I've looked up. Okay, our basic equation is the drag equation, and you'll be seeing this equation a lot over these next couple lectures. 
Um, everything in that equation we know. We know density, we know velocity, we know area. The only tricky thing is the coefficient of drag. So let's get the coefficient of drag. So first let's get the Reynolds number for the back edge of the first plate. And then the Reynolds number for the back edge of the second plate is twice that because it's twice as long. You can see both of these Reynolds numbers are above the transition point. So these are turbulent boundary layers, at least, at least at the back edge. It is a smooth plate, so that means we can use our equation for coefficient of drag, and we can calculate that for both signs. And you can see the coefficient of drag is a little lower for the longer sign. Then it's just a matter of plugging all those numbers into the drag equation and you get pretty similar forces acting on both signs except for the longer skinnier one it's a little bit lower.